Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll move on this listener right now in your gentle, loving, powerful, and merciful way as they listen to this message from All Nations Church in Tallahassee. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 1, reading one verse of Scripture this morning, that being verse 8. Many of you no doubt have the Scripture memorized, know exactly what Jesus said. We're continuing today to talk about the power of the Spirit and what happens when you and I choose to live in the power of the Spirit. Last week, you'll remember, we talked about the fact that God is personal to each one of us, that He moves in us and through us in different ways according to His will and to His pleasure. Aren't you thankful that God made each one of us different and unique, that none of us are the same, and because of His creation and He knows us, then he moves on us individually as well. Second, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12 tells us he also gives us gifts according to his will and his pleasure. We don't possess them, he does. He simply gives them to us in that moment of need and allows us to be used by him. So Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus said, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the ends of the earth. Father, we thank you today for this opportunity to be in the presence of a living God. We thank you that you're in this room. Your Holy Spirit is present today, and he's touching hearts and touching lives. Touch those that are joining us online, both today and tomorrow and next week or next month, whenever they should watch this service. And let the power of the living God bring anointing and change into their lives. We ask it in your name. Amen. We talked about the fact that God is personal. And when we don't understand that God moves with us in a personal way, then there are many mistakes in dealing with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There are many misconceptions. There's misuse and abuse when we don't understand that God moves in a personal way. In John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, I'm going to send the Spirit of truth who will guide you into all truth. We need to understand the purpose of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is not so that you and I can have a gift to brag about, but rather it's so that we can reveal truth in and through our lives by the power of the Spirit of God. Today I want to talk about point number two in this series. And that is that the Holy Spirit gives us power. He gives us power. The power comes all the time. It resides within us. And then His presence and power enables spiritual gifts to flow through our life as needed in moments and in times. These gifts are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We talked about it two weeks ago. There are the power gifts, the gifts of faith and miracles and healing. There are then the gifts of inspiration, the gifts of uh, tongues and interpretation of tongues and prophecy. And then there are gifts of revelation, which are a word of wisdom, a word of uh, knowledge and discerning of spirits. We're going to talk about these nine gifts over the next two weeks and unpack that so you understand how these gifts can and will be used in your life. We need to understand that when we are living in the power of the Spirit, then every day the gifts of the Spirit are operating in us and through us. We need to understand it doesn't matter if we're in church or if we're at work. When the need arises and Spirit of the Spirit of God lives within us, then He allows us to move in the needed gift to meet the need at that point of time. I'm going to show you how He does that throughout the Scripture. We need to understand that the gifts of the Spirit are not limited to a sanctuary. Somebody should say amen. It's no problem. I can do it myself. It's okay. Amen. The gifts of the Spirit are not limited to a sanctuary or a church service. Holy Spirit resides in you. He leads you. He guides you. He directs you. He teaches you. Therefore, at any moment in time, whether you're at the doctor's office or the mechanic's shop, whether you find yourself in the lumber yard or the grocery store, when a need arises, you can depend on the power of the Spirit of God to release the needed gift to meet that need. Folks, that's what we've got to understand. The gifts aren't mine, they're His. And He moves in us and through us according to His will and purposes in those times of need. 
So many times, though, we have reduced the gifts of the Holy Spirit down to three. I said two. Let's try three, all right? Down to three. We've reduced those gifts to speaking in tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and prophecy, which is what we most frequently see within the church. And may I say to you, because of that, they are the most abused of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. More flesh is involved in those gifts than the operation of any other gifts. But that isn't where God wants us to stop. He wants to give us a word of wisdom. He wants to give us a word of knowledge. He wants to give us supernatural faith. He wants to give us miracles and gifts of healing and the gift of discernment. Do you hear what I'm saying? We have limited him so much through our finite thinking that we don't allow the Spirit of God to accomplish all that he desires in our lives. Nine gifts, not three. And as Pentecostals, we need to remember that. So when we understand that, then we understand the gifts of the Spirit occur and work when there are times of need, whether it's here or whether it's out in our everyday life. And when we understand that, then we begin to assimilate the thinking of this fact that these gifts are made to display the power and the presence of God. Not for you to possess and own, but to display the power and presence of God. And the gifts are not internal, they are external. Every single one of those nine gifts has something to do with what's in front of us. They're made to work outside the believer. You say, I'm not sure I believe that. We'll read Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. The Bible makes it very, very clear. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs shall follow those who believe in my name. They will take up servants. If they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. And it goes on to say they will speak in new tongues. They will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We need to read those scriptures one more time. And understand, that's not my words, that's Jesus saying to his disciples, this is what's going to happen in your life. Every one of those displays of the Spirit of God were outward, not inward. These signs shall follow them that my believe. In my name they cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They take up servants. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So my question is if you really believe that what I have just read is the inspired, infallible, authoritative Word of God, why aren't we living that way? Why don't we see the operation of the gifts regularly, not just when the Spirit is so strong that we can't help but move into His presence? Folks, I've come to challenge you today. The gifts of the Spirit are not just for other believers, they are for the world. For men and women to see the presence and the power of a living God. All of these things I just read about in Mark 16 happened in the New Testament. You can read about it in Acts, with the exception of drinking any deadly thing. It shall not harm you. Now, I think the only way we would have known that happened is if someone did it on purpose, and then I'm not sure the grace of God is going to cover that. However, every other thing occurred. Let's look at that. Casting out devils, Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 19, each one of those show us this pattern. Speaking in new tongues, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, taking up serpents. Happened one time in Acts chapter, I believe it was 28. The Apostle Paul was shipwrecked. He was gathering wood for a fire, and as he threw the wood on the fire, a deadly snake attached itself to his hand. The Bible says he simply shook it off into the fire and went about his business. The natives of that island knew he was about to die. Because every time that snake bit somebody, they died. And it says they were amazed that he was not sick, that he didn't die. And it gave Paul the opportunity to what? Proclaim the truth and the grace of Jesus Christ. That didn't happen so they could say, wow, he's a superman. He's a God, even though that was their thought. 
it happened so he had a door of entryway to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, Al, that was then. It doesn't happen anymore. I was in Costa Rica some years ago. And a snake they call a two-step snake because it bites you and you're dead in two steps. Hit me on the left ankle, on the inside of my ankle. It was dark. I didn't know. I didn't, couldn't see. Walked up to where there was light. There was blood on my ankle. And it began swelling. I just prayed and kept going. I had a team of 20 guys there. I wasn't going to fall down. I wasn't going to stop. And the grace of God covered me. You know, when I was talking to the missionary and the doctors about it, they said, well, the snake must have already released some of its venom before it hits you. And you didn't get the whole load. I was telling that story to my grandson who was 10 at the time, and he said, Pops, that's not what happened. God protected you. God kept that snake from making you sick and dying. I've got news for you. It still happens today if we will simply do what God has called us to do. When we do what He's called us to do, where we go where He's called us to go, then we have the assurance that He's going to make the way. He's going to open the doors. Folks, it's time to stop being afraid. Thank you. I'm going to say it again. It's time to stop being afraid. Do you understand the government wants nothing more than to make you quake in your boots every moment of every day so that you have to depend on them? I've chosen not to believe that report, but I've chosen to believe the true report and to declare my God is able to carry me through regardless of the circumstances. Oh, you don't understand, preacher. There's a new variant. Can I tell you something? There will always be a new variant. And if you don't get over it and get beyond it, you're going to be captured, paralyzed and captured in your fear for the remainder of your life. I'm speaking to someone right now today. You haven't come back because you're afraid. It's time to get over the fear. Put your faith in God and get in the house of God. Stop saying that you don't understand, preacher. You don't know my circumstance. Maybe I don't, but I know my God. And I know my God is able to carry you through if you'll push the fear aside and move forward in faith and in the power of the Spirit of God. But as long as you keep listening to what they're saying, you're going to be bound in that fear. You're going to be paralyzed, refusing to do anything or go anywhere. I'm going to stay at home and have my groceries delivered. I can work from home now. I never have to get out of my pajamas. I love being at home. It's time to get out of your house and back into the fight. Back into the fight. God doesn't give you the power of the Spirit of God so you can sit in your house, do your devotions, speak in tongues, and think, my, what a powerful man or woman of God I am. He gives you the power of the Spirit to send you into the world, into the darkened places, and declare, it doesn't matter what the world says, what the enemy says, I've heard a sure reports. And I'm going to believe the Word of God. Amen. When you get home today, you need to share this service with everybody you know. You need to email them and say, listen to this. Because when we choose to live in the power of God, God chooses to show His presence and His power through us. It's all up to you and me. Fourth thing that passage says in Mark 16 is, they lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 14, Acts chapter 28, on and on and on I can go. The scripture validates through the New Testament church this promise of Jesus Christ. And if we're a New Testament church, which we like to bandy that phrase around, but if we're a New Testament church, those things should be occurring as well. You know what? I was thrilled. I think it was two weeks ago when people came up to me after service and said, my daughter had been demon possessed, but she was set free in the service today. It didn't happen down here. It happened back there when a group of believers gathered and believed the word of God and bound the forces of darkness and freedom and liberty came to a person's life. Folks, that shouldn't be occasional. It should be every day because do you know, have you came to the place where you discern the fact that hell has unleashed demonic entities 
on the world. There are more people demon possessed today than there ever have been. And you don't have to go to the dark jungles of Africa to find them. Just walk down to the corner. There's a spirit of murder and mayhem unleashed on the world today. People say, how could somebody run through a crowd of people and kill five and injure 50? Let me tell you how. It's the forces of darkness driving them to do that stuff. Folks, it's time to recognize I'm not afraid of the devil. I'm not backing down from demons. I'm going to stand and declare the power of God lives in me. And when I see you, you better run because I'm going to send you back to hell. Come on. Stop living in fear of what's happening around you and begin walking in faith and see what God will do. You see, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given for one reason. Not to create a name for you. Not to build a reputation. Not so that you can blow on people or wave your coat and they all fall down. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to advance the kingdom of God. And if that isn't your motive, don't call it a gift of the Holy Spirit. Call it what it is. That's me walking in the flesh. So we need to understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit are to destroy the works of the devil, to liberate people and to set them free, to heal sick bodies. And there's four reasons, four purposes for the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, to bring honor and glory to God. Listen, anytime somebody says to me, did you see what I did? Who's getting the glory? It's not the Father. You just took it for yourself. And may I tell you, the Father isn't pleased with that. However, if you say to me, oh, pastor, you won't believe what happened. The Spirit showed up in such a powerful way. He touched that individual's life. It was amazing. It was wonderful. Healing occurred. Then I'm going to get on the wagon and I'm going to shout glory and honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Second reason is to bring salvation to others when they see these signs that Mark described in Mark chapter 16. See, it's an open door. It opens eyes. It causes people to see what they've never seen before. But the majority of the world has no idea about the power of God. When they think about God, they think of some benign being who's sitting on the cloud somewhere in the sky. They don't understand he's a father. They don't understand he's a healer. They don't understand he's a deliverer. They don't understand his grace is sufficient for every circumstance. And they don't understand that when people are connected to God, the power of the Spirit of God flows through them and supernatural things occur. But you and I have that responsibility. So that people see Jesus working through us. Number three, it's to bring healing to the body of Christ and to those around us. Number four, it's to show that one is truly a believer. So I don't know if I agree with that. Well, not my problem. Need to read the scripture again. These signs shall follow them that believe. These signs shall follow them that believe. So the question is, do you believe he's able? Do you believe he's real? Do you believe he's powerful? Do you believe the gifts are for today? Do you believe you're washed in the blood and filled with the Holy Ghost? What do you believe? Because if you believe the gospel, these signs shall follow them that believe. Believers, listen to me carefully, should never follow signs. But signs should always follow believers. I'm going to say that one more time. Believers should never follow signs. But signs should always follow believers. Every miraculous demonstration of God's power should focus attention on the Lord Jesus Christ. And each encounter of the New Testament brought multiplication to the church. People say, well, I don't know, why isn't the church growing? Maybe it's because we're not operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Maybe it's because we place little emphasis on the power of God. Maybe it's because we have put Holy Spirit in the back room only to come out when it's convenient or right or proper. I got news for you. 
As long as I'm your pastor, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come and fill this place. Touch every heart and every life. I like nothing more than when he interrupts a service and does miraculous things and I don't preach. Let me tell you something. He's a much better preacher than I am. And he demonstrates the presence and the power of God. You see, the gifts are manifestations. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Manifestations of God's presence. It says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for, for profit for all. The Greek word manifestation, if you want to look it up, it means a shining forth. It means making visible. It means a clear display. This is the one I really like. It means plain evidence. I like that. When the gifts of the Holy Spirit are manifested, it brings plain evidence that God is alive and God is real and God is able. Touches men's hearts and lives. Now think about this. You and I, you and I are to reveal the presence of the Holy Spirit. He uses us through his gifts to reveal the presence of Holy Spirit. The key thought in that statement is he uses us. We don't use him. He uses us for his gifts to operate. We don't use them for our purposes. I really want you to understand that. Too many people think I'm here to use the gifts of the Spirit. No, the Spirit is here to use you in the gifts of the Spirit. You've got to get that in our minds. Too many have it backwards. They think somehow that the spirit, gifts of the Spirit are tools that we use to do the work of God. In reality, we are the tools Holy Spirit uses to do the work of God. I'm going to say that one more time. We are the tools Holy Spirit uses to do the work of God. That's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he gives every man severally as he wills in regard to the gifts of the Spirit. So I always get a little heebie-jeebies when someone says to me, I got the gift of prophecy. No, you don't. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. You don't possess that. He does. And he chooses to allow you to operate in those gifts. God is saying to us this morning through this message and by his word, he wants us to live, to speak, to minister in the power of the Spirit. See, because when we do that, then God is magnified. God is glorified. God is made known to those around us. And then the church becomes the church of the living God. Instead, the church of the dead. God wants to use you and I. He wants His presence to be evident through our lives to those around us. So that He's glorified in our lives. We have to come to understand the Holy Spirit is our strength. He is our source. Nothing we do comes from this flesh. Nothing we do flows through our intellect. Nothing we do flows through our training or our education or our history or our background or our pedigree. See, it doesn't matter if your great-grandma was a founding member of this church or any other church. That's past. That's gone. That's history. I'm asking you, what is God doing in your life today? How is Holy Spirit moving in you today? I appreciate the past. I thank God for what he's done, but it's behind me. I can't live there. I've got to press on and look forward and recognize the hour in which I live and say, God, I need more of your Holy Spirit. Let his power fall on me. He's the source of our strength. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, the scripture says these words. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Even Zechariah understood that. Hundreds of years before Jesus came, before Holy Spirit was outpoured, Zechariah said, It's not by power nor by might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Micah chapter 3, verse 8, but truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord. 
Why don't you make that your mantra? Why don't you make that your motto? Why don't make that the word you speak every morning? Why don't you make that the word that comes out of you every time you encounter a circumstance or situation that can't be resolved by humanity, that only God can step in or intervene? Why don't you say, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord? Change the way we think and the way we talk. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus said, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. It's interesting, when we read these scriptures, it's a direct contradiction to the way many believers live. Because they don't live in power, they live in fear that something might harm me. Something might hurt me. Something might damage me. Can I tell you, friend? If you'll live where you're supposed to live, walk where you're supposed to walk, be full of the power of the Spirit of God, yeah, you'll have some issues, you'll have some difficulties, you'll walk through some things, but the good news is, greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. You are a victor, you're an overcomer because of the power of the Spirit of God. Luke 24, 49, Jesus said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, tarry in Jerusalem until you've been endued with power from on high. And the power Holy Spirit brings into our life is greater than any other power on the face of this planet, greater than any power of hell, greater than anything you will ever encounter. So when I say that, I say believers should never be bound in fear should never worry, should never be distraught, should never be anxious, wringing their hands. Oh, come on. We know what's going to happen. We've read the book. We understand God's timeline. And now we simply need to be filled with the power of the Spirit so that we can move and operate to reap the harvest that's before us. He is the source of our strength. Ephesians 3.16 says that He would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man. I don't know about you, but I want some of that. I want that every day. Strengthen me by might in in my inner man. When the Spirit is in your inner being, then you're able to handle anything that comes against you. Any temptation, any worry, any fear, any stress, any tension, all buzzwords that are a part of our society, you'll be able to handle it. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that maybe the Apostle Paul knew some tension, some problems, some difficulties? I believe he probably did. He was shipwrecked twice. He was beaten more times than I can remember. He was stoned and left for dead. But the good news is the power of the Spirit strengthened him in his inner man so that when those things occur, he would always arise. He'd stand back up on his feet and he would move forward to advance the kingdom of God. Let me say it this way. You need to quit worrying about what's going to happen to you today and start worrying about, God, how are you going to use me today? You see, every one of us, according to the Scripture, have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that seal tells me that no matter what happens in my life, whatever I encounter, I'm going to move forward in God. And if that seal and that encounter means that I'm going to face something that takes this physical life, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to shout. I'm going to rejoice. I'm going to give him honor and glory because my life is not bound to this world. My life is over there and I'm looking forward to the day when he calls me home. Stop living like this is all there is. This life is not all there is. And when the Spirit of God fills you with power and might in your inner man, then you can walk unafraid into any circumstance or situation. You have no worries. You have no fear. I know I'm following God. I know God's plan is good for me. I know God only has the best for me. So if he wants me to go through some pain, I'm going through it. If he wants me to go through some heartache, I'm going through it. If he wants me to go through some danger, I'm going through it. Oh, somebody, hear me today. It's time to say I'm full of the power of the Spirit, and I will face anything the devil throws in my path. 
and not only face it, I'll come out victorious. Well, Pastor, what about all those saints who've died in the faith? Read Hebrews chapter 11. Come on, read it one more time, especially the last part of it, where it talks about those who were sawn asunder, those whose heads were severed from them, those who were tortured and persecuted. You know what it says? They received their reward. Looking forward to the day I receive my... Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not going to do anything stupid to try to make that happen. Some of you say, oh, yeah? You already have, Pastor. Pastor. I'm just following God. And if following God means I put my life in danger, I'm going to follow God. If following God means some heartache and some pain, I'm going to follow God. Folks, you've got to understand that a man or a woman of God is never deterred by what happens in their body or what happens around them. They understand no matter what I go through, God will bring me to victory. And if death is the doorway to that victory, so be it. So be it. Because my future is greater than my present home. John 14, you need to read it, verses 1 through 4. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am there, you may be also. Folks, do you understand there is a place prepared for every born-again believer in the realms of heaven? So I don't know that I buy all that. Read the book of Revelation. Read about the streets of gold. Read about the river of life that flows from the throne of God. And everything it touches brings life. I'm talking to you this morning about the reason we live in the power of the Spirit. Because the power of the Spirit enables us to overcome our fears, our frustrations, our uncertainties, our anxiety, and move into a place where the Lord God uses us in a mighty way. Power of the Spirit. When we talk about the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit operating in our lives... We need to understand those gifts are given to us for several reasons. Through the power of the Spirit, we have strength in the time of battle. I know we talk a lot about battle, but we need to understand we are in a fight. We're either warriors or we're victims. We're either overcomers or we're conquered. We're either the ones that are following God or we're sitting on the sidelines licking our wounds. I don't know about you, but I'm going to be in the first category every single time. I am a victor. I am an overcomer. I am a champion. I am not defeated. He is defeated. My foe is already done for. And it's up to me through the power of the Spirit to show him he's powerless against the people of God. To give us strength in times of battle. If you're not in the fight, you need to get in the fight. If you don't understand spiritual warfare, you need to read about it, learn it, and apply it to your life. And when we need those gifts in times of battle, then the Lord Holy Spirit dispenses those into our lives, and those gifts bring victory in those times. It gives us renewal in times of duress. When we fought until there's nothing left. When we're physically, emotionally, mentally drained. When we can't put one foot in front of another, when we're saying, God, I can't go on, then strength flows into our lives. Holy Spirit strengthens us by His might in our inner man and enables us to be renewed and recharged and refilled with the power of God. Talking to someone here today, you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. You once were filled with this power, but you stopped going back to the well. You stop drinking from the source. That power has ebbed away. It's time today to come back and be refilled again. To have help in times of fear. I've said it a dozen times already. When the Spirit of God is in your life, there is no reason to fear anything. He gives us power to overcome that. To have resistance during time of attack. This is key and this is critical. Because too many believers are living in victory as long as things are going well. 
As long as there's money in the bank, there's health in my body, there is peace in my home, everything is going great. But when something goes sideways, when the devil tries to derail your train, when there isn't money in the bank, when there isn't health in your body, when there isn't peace in your home, then Holy Spirit comes in. He fills you with power that enables you to keep walking in the plan of God. I get so tired of whiny believers who just want to tell me what's wrong in their life. Would someone say, it doesn't matter what I'm facing. It doesn't matter what I'm encountering. It doesn't matter what I'm feeling. I choose to believe God's Word. I am filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. He has strengthened me in my inner man by His might, and nothing is going to stop me. Would somebody agree with me? Say, Lord, we're moving on. And have power in time of weakness. Have power in time of weakness. That's talking about our physical weaknesses, our limitations, to have power in times of weakness. If the church is going to be the church, and I'm talking to you and me, we're the church, then we have to, and if we're going to answer the challenge the world gives us every single day, if we're going to be the people God's called us to be, then we have got to stand up and declare to the world there is dimension of life that you will never experience outside of Jesus Christ. There's a dimension of power you will never know outside Holy Spirit. You're not going to find it on Wall Street. You won't find it in the casino. You won't find it at the beach. You won't find it in the mountains. You sure won't find it at Disney World. You won't find it in Hollywood or Washington, D.C. Let me tell you where you do find that power and that life. You don't find it in pleasure palaces or political places or power places, but rather you find it at the throne of God when God the Holy Spirit overwhelms you, overcomes you, fills you with power and might. Then you'll see what God can do. You'll see how great our God really is. Tom, would you come back? please. See, I believe God wants to move His church beyond a place where we're constantly asking for blessing to a place where we walk in His power, to a place where we understand His presence, to a place where we operate in His gifts every single day, 24-7, in the building and out of the building, to a place where we are asking not, oh, Lord, bless me. But we're asking, Lord, use me to be a demonstration of your power. Use me to be a demonstration of your glory. Use me to be a demonstration of your grace and your goodness. Stand to your feet with me today. In just a moment, Tom's going to sing that song again, We Did a Miracle. Before he sings it, I want to ask you a question. Are you in this room this morning and everything I've talked about sounds wonderful, but you have no idea how to receive what I've described? There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. It's why understanding he died for your sins, he is the perfect sacrifice. And more than anything, he longs to make you a child of the living God. He does that when you choose to confess your sins and ask Him to forgive you and to come into your heart and your life. So if you're in this room this morning and you need Him to forgive you, right where you stand, just slip up your hand and say, pray with me. I need Jesus to forgive me. Yes, sir. Someone else. Yes, sir. Someone else. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Just slip up that hand. Yes, sir. Anyone else? Slip up that hand. I'm waiting just a moment for you. Every one of you that raised your hand, step out now and come. You're men. Be a man. Step out and come. Don't worry about what anybody thinks or says. This is the greatest moment in your life. Come on. A lot of you right back there. Raise your hands. Come on and come. Come on and come. And God's going to touch you in this altar this morning. He's going to, as you confess your sins, He's going to change your life and change you for all of eternity. Come right on down. Stand right here. Elders and deacons, I need you right now. Right behind them, please. Elders and deacons, come. Right behind them. Please come, ladies and gentlemen. And help me right now as we pray for these individuals. Put your hand on their shoulders. 
I'm going to pray a general prayer. You're going to pray it with me. And then these individuals standing behind you are going to pray specifically for you and for the needs in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, say this with me. Pray this with me. I confess my sins. I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to come into my life and change me. Make me a new creature, a new man, a new woman. Change my heart. Live in me. I accept you as my Savior. I receive you as my Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, would you pray with those that are around them? Pray right now with them personally. When they're finished, uh, Mark, would you take them to the green room, please? And pray with them there as well, all right? Take them to the green room, pray with them, and bring them right back into service in just a moment. Second question, you're here today, and you say, Preacher, you talked to me this morning. I need the power of the Spirit of God in my life. I need to be able to demonstrate His power to those around me. My world is dark, and I want to be the light. That's you. From wherever you're at, just step out and come. I need the power of the Spirit of God. If I were standing where you're at, I'd be the first in this altar this morning, because I need the power of the Spirit of God from across the building. Step out and come. Let God fill you. Let God renew you. Don't let your pride keep you where you're at, but respond to Holy Spirit and let Him do something in your life today that is nothing short of supernatural and amazing. I need God to fill me, Holy Spirit to fill me, Jesus to fill me with the power of the Spirit of God so that I will be light and a demonstration of His presence to my world. Come on, I'm waiting on you. Spirit of God is waiting on you to respond and say, I want that power. I want your presence. I want you moving in our lives. Begin praying with them, praying for them. Right now, those of you who just responded, simply lift your hands and say, God, fill me. God, fill me. Let your power flow through me. Just make it your cry. God, fill me. God, fill me. God, fill me. I need your power. I need your presence. I want to be a demonstration of you. God, fill me. Tom, sing it out. Would you please? We need a miracle. You made it to the end of the message, and now what? Is God leading you to make a change? Are you needing a good church home where you can grow and help others grow as you fulfill your part in the body of Christ? Then we invite you to join us at All Nations Church on Sharer Road in Tallahassee, a multicultural church founded on the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Our Sunday morning service is at 10.30 and Wednesday night service at 7, plus youth group and kid power and small groups and more. For more information, visit our website, allnationstallahassee.com.